Welcome, folks, to another episode of the Consulting Podcast. This is your host, Mohammed Misba, aka the Consulting Guy. Today is a very, very special episode uh, with a very, very special guest. Uh, we have today Mo Yang with us, who is probably the most famous uh, unknown person that uh, in the industry, uh, in consulting industry right now. So, uh, Mo, I don't want to spoil, but I'll let you do the the uh, the intro. How are you? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm I'm great. So, so Mo, for those who don't know you, why am I so excited right now? I have no idea. I <laughs> have absolutely no idea why you would be. Maybe uh, something so to do with your T-shirt, your uh, shirt oh, that you're yeah, wearing. You know, I have to represent the merch. There you go. There you go. So go for it. So my name is Mo Yang. Um, I uh, run a Instagram page called Consulting Humor. Um, have been doing so for the past two and a half years or so. Um, and Mohammed says, you know, most famous unknown person. Um, I had run it semi-anonymously. Uh, for an amount of time. Um, although I think the current situation um, has allowed me to be a little bit more um, cavalier with at least my mm. personal image and, and branding. So this is kind of my, uh, I guess the official face reveal, right? Absolutely. So I've done something, some stuff low key before, but um, I think this really um, solidifies it. Excellent. And I think as of, uh, was it two weeks ago when I, I saw the first time you had put yourself out there with the whole emailing your uh, the emailing meme that you sent out and, and there were folks sort of mentioning in the comments, Hey, is that the official face reveal? Is that you? Well, and, those and... were only from people who knew me. Ah, um, okay. Okay. I was like, I'm not saying if it is or isn't, but. <laughs> yep. Yep. I know you sort of played it in the gray area, but consulting humor. So for, for those, and I'm sure everyone listening in is well aware of consulting humor. You have now over 300,000 followers. My God, in, in the span of two years. I mean, I remember yeah. when uh, I think I was one of the initial followers, you were still in your 10s and 20K ish followers. Um, and, and you just took an exponential spike, you know, year over year, month over month. Yeah, no, the growth has been incredible. Um, right up there with us with the peer groups. I mean, I mean, uh, in my peer group, I would say, you know, there's consultant comedy, um, yep. and of course, uh, crazy management consultants. Um, definitely the preeminent names within the, uh, consulting theme meme game. Um, but yeah, I've been really pleased at the, uh, growth. I never thought it would be anything close to that. Um, I was just doing it for fun in the very beginning, um, mm -hmm. just kind of posting the odd meme to fishbowl and, uh, using, and this, I know this is going to sound extremely backwards, but, uh, using Instagram as a, a holding cell, uh, for some of these ideas. So I didn't <laughs> spam the fishbowl feed. Ha! Which again is is completely backwards, right? Look, look, um, yeah, look how it turned around. <laughs> right, and and part of the reason for that is because I'm not a social media person. I don't. Uh, I definitely don't use Facebook. Um, <laughs> I was around when Facebook started. Uh, I was in college yeah. when Facebook started, so of course I have an account and everything like that. But um, no, I'm not very in tune with how that works. Although it's become kind of you know, I don't think I'm. I'm a part of the core demographic that still uses Facebook um, mm. anymore. Uh, definitely didn't use Instagram. Um, and I'm still kind of feeling my way around things like Twitter. Uh, I have no idea uh, what Twitter is for. Um, <laughs> it just seems like, I don't know, it just seems like, you know, if you don't have a lot of followers on Twitter, yeah. you're kind of talking into a vacuum, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the re only reason I have Twitter is because, you know, you can uh, clip a shot for, for Instagram. Yeah. Again, kind of. Kind it serves of silly. the purpose. Exactly. Exactly. It's just, um, I don't know. I think it's really stupid to be honest with you. Um, but I mean, that's that's how these things go. Um, mm -hmm. The learning curve was definitely steep. Um, again, because I just had no idea um, what to do or how to grow the following. Um, but at some point, you know, I said to myself, "Hey, look, you know, if this is going to be something you're going to spend time doing, you might as well yeah. do it well, right?" Um, and so it became kind of a, a hobby uh, and very rewarding in that respect, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just like anything else um, that you would consider a hobby, one of the things is, you know, you, you do it for fun, you don't do it for money, and you do it because it's rewarding when you get better at it, right? Yeah. And uh, something like social media, it's very quantifiable how good you get at it, right? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, if that was the measure of success, um, I do remember in the very beginning, again, not knowing anything about how this works, um, you know, just kind of put my consulting hat on and just said, hey, look, 
I'm just going to do a little bit of research. Um, going to Google it, which is terrible. It's a terrible idea. Don't Google it because <laughs> you know, nobody, nobody really knows what they're talking about on there. And I've watched a lot of YouTube videos and I can't get that time back in my life ever again. I've wasted hours upon hours just looking at these, like, I don't know how else to describe it. These chads, you know, like, Hey, what's up? It's your boy. Yo, don't forget to click that subscribe button, hit the bell button. And uh, yo, I'm going to tell you how to get like a million, a million followers in like three days. I'm like, all right. That is not there was a lot of that. It was a lot of yeah, that yeah. Um, over the top bombastic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, you know, I was like, okay, well, let me go ask somebody who, you know, by my measure of success is successful at this sort of thing. So the first person I actually asked was the big four accountant. Um, mm. which, you know, accounting and consulting, we're, we're in the same vein. Um, at least we understand each other. Right. So yeah, I reached yeah. out to him. He was very helpful in terms of the kind of, you know, very early do's and don'ts, um, okay. uh, to kind of get started. And from there, it really just, it gained a lot of momentum. Um, and it's just been going like that ever, ever since. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. I mean, uh, it, it seems like years away past right? It's two, it's only been two and a half years where you've got an exponential growth, but uh, what, what, we will definitely get into a lot about your channel and sort of the growth you've seen, but um, certainly want to start, take a step back and, and really understand how you got involved with consulting, right? Obviously you, you run a very successful social media channel, right? Um, folks understand and get a lot of what is consulting through the humor and, and how you portray consulting, which is a great part about it. But how did you yourself start in consulting? And, and was this your passion from day one? No, um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I love it now. Um, okay. But no, my, my path has not really been linear. Um, I, mm. so kind of to, to backtrack a little bit, I've, you know, I've been talking to uh, uh, some folks uh, and interviewing some, you know, some director level folks um, at both PwC and at Deloitte and one of the things I asked the same thing, right? Um, and there's something that's been changing lately. Uh, and it's that consulting has been getting a lot more visibility for better or worse. Um, mm -hmm. So, and we can talk about this later, but like, you know, folks like McKinsey, for example, um, are kind of at the forefront of what maybe the general public would perceive as some um, morally dubious uh, types of, uh, engagements and things like that. Yeah. Again, yeah. whether true or not, that's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that it's really been brought to the attention of, of the media recently in a way that it hadn't been before, or at least not in a way that people really cared. Like, yeah. you know, you could get things in your newsfeed because you're a consultant, because Google knows that you are in consulting or in the general public would be like, yeah, whatever. I, I don't care what this is. Right. Um, but it's, you know, it's gotten to a point where, um, you know, high school, it's something that high school students will aspire to be. Mm. Um, somebody had told me that one of their classmates um, wants to be a consultant for Deloitte um, in the future. And they're what, at a, at a high school level. Yes, like 14 or 15. Um, Poor guy or gal. Yeah, no, I'm joking. It's, I'm joking. <laughs> no, it's just a strange thing. And I'm yeah, sure yeah. that that existed in yeah. the past, like what with, you know, high school groups like like DECA, for example, and mm -hmm. people who are business oriented from the, the get go, um, or MBA oriented, um, yeah. I'm sure that career path has been something that they've been acutely aware of for yeah. you know, their entire lives. Uh, but for people like me, um, you know, growing up with Asian parents, I think the list of professions, the acceptable professions were was probably pretty thin. So, you know, pharmacy, uh, medicine, dentistry, engineering, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Accountancy was actually on my mom's short list for, I don't know why. I just know what accountants do. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty much where I was um, at the very beginning. So I foolishly uh, selected biomedical engineering as a, mm. as a major, which was bullshit. It was so hard. Um, it was, un it was unreasonably hard. Okay. Um, so if I could do it all over again, I'd just do some bullshit like business degree or something like that, because mm -hmm. Um, later on in grad school, I realized that how easy anything is compared to engineering because engineering is just, you know, you, you would know, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just brutal. Did, uh, yeah. <sighs> and we, and you know, you and I both, both went to Rutgers engineering. I mean, it's just, uh, I can't explain it. It, it. Like, no, it, it was extremely difficult. I mean, there were some classes where you would spend hours upon, and I'm sure every, every major has the story, right? But for engineering specifically, we would spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, right? And still see no uh, light at the end of the tunnel. 
Um, and the career-wise as well, right? I think I'd love to hear by the time you were graduating, how that translated, what, what were you were looking at from a biomedical perspective? Oh, no, uh, I, I copped out of, of engineering and it took me okay. like three years, which is really dumb for me to realize that this is not something that I want to do. It's not that I was bad at it um, per se. It was just like everything just felt like a chore um, mm. and nothing, I don't know, nothing felt good. Um, so I thought to myself, you know, I just want to kind of academics, man, it comes to a certain point where you just want to get out. So yeah, yeah. my third year of engineering, I was like, no, you know what, let me just, because there's no way this is going to get any easier uh, at this point. So I copped out with a biology degree. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and even that wasn't like, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. But I think the whole education thing was a misstep, um, at least in terms of what I was there to learn, right? Um, but I did apply my degree. So my first career uh, was a, um, I worked my way up through a, a lab manager position mm. um, at an academic university over at the Medical University of South Carolina um, down in Charleston, right? Um, so I was working in a protein synthesis lab, um, doing some pretty, pretty interesting work. Um, mm. It's about then I kind of discovered that I didn't want to do anything in uh, academia. Um, okay. The PhD path was offered up to me and I thought about it for a second. I'm like, no, um, not only is there, well, there is money in it if, you know, if you kind of strike gold, right? But for the most part, if we're talking about academic research, it's a lot of grinding and fighting for grants. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, if you're lucky enough to get your own lab, um, you know, but it's an entire process. And of course, the PhD, there's nothing guaranteed about it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I've known people that have spent seven years um, trying to do something. One of my buddies, uh, in fact, he spent seven years trying to do some kind of um, uh, polymerization reaction, and it just didn't end up panning out. And you know what he did? He said, screw it, I'm done with this, went to med school, got his MD and is practicing now. Now right? so it was never too late. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's seven years of his life gone um i'm not saying he wasted it it's just like for some things it's just incredibly um i don't want to say luck based almost um but you know you choose a bad project or a project that doesn't end up going anywhere um i, I was going to say right i mean yeah. even it's not not just any other like you know medical field or, or biology or what have your chemistry it, it's luck is a, a core factor I would say, and, and a quite a prominent factor in how you progress and if you progress, right? To the example that you were starting, right? The, if, you, if you end up at the right project at the right time with the right client and the right team, right? The stars align, you're probably going to ride the wave. But if you don't luck out and if you're unlucky, right? Some may even say that, and you're in a, a very small project out in the boonies with, with you know, very low numbers, really not out there, um, then it, it may not matter at the end of the year right, when you're doing that uh, calculation. Uh, but, but you made an interesting point that I think we've talked about previously as well, right? The, the influence of, uh, and I'm assuming you're first generation American, second generation? Uh, zero generation? I zero generation, I came, okay. I came, came from China, so what is, okay. where does that put me? Um, first, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I, the reason why I bring that up is because, you know, growing up, I had a similar track where, the options for a career path were quite limited, right? And I come from a Pakistani background. It's all the Asian, I would say, continent, right? Asia continent. Um, and, and it was essentially either you go into the medical field, you go into engineering, and, and slowly it was opening up to becoming an attorney, right? The, the three. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, my sisters went into medical. I went into engineering. And, and that's, that's, that's the end of it. But throughout my path uh, and my, my, uh, my undergrad, um, I, I sort of felt the same way. I did not know what consulting was, but it, I knew that I did not want to be an engineer. I don't want to sit behind a desk and, and you know, I, was, I did uh, mechanical engineering undergrad. I don't want to design a screw on an aircraft for the rest of my life and, and you know, try to get the angles right and figure out the, the efficiency that provides. Um, and it was quite lucky of me that I was at a dinner once and I, I overheard some folks talking about consulting and how uh, this person's aunt travels and has clients. And I just eavesdropped and asked. And, and that, that's how I applied to Accenture and, and it started the process. So nice. did, did, uh, did I, what, I guess once you got out of your initial career path, right, which is more of the, the, the sciences and the academia, 
how how did you transition into consulting? So it, it kind of happened while I was in grad school. Um, so like I said, you know, the PhD path was offered up to me and I said, well, no, I probably don't want to do this. Um, okay. Not for the rest of my life anyway. Um, so what can I do to get out, but in a way that's somewhat tangential to what I've, you know, come to know already. Mm -hmm. So, you know, academic research um, is, uh, you know, usually performed in, in uh, a facility that has an accompanying hospital, right? Like a teaching hospital. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, okay, well, what if I just go into the administrative side? So I went to grad school for my MHA, um, got my healthcare, um, master's in healthcare administration, right? Mm -hmm. And they weren't even consulting focused. So they were very academic medicine focused. So for mm. example, um, you'd come out and you'd be, you know, you kind of work your way up on the administrative side at a hospital like, you know, Johns Hopkins or Duke or MD Anderson or something like that, right? Um, and so payer side, like insurance, um, post-acute, um, mm -hmm. a bunch of different facets of what you could, you know, utilize that degree for weren't really explored at the time. Um, but I think that what really changed the landscape quickly uh, was the Affordable Care Act. So around that time, um, the Affordable Care Act came out and, you know, people were scared. Anytime any new policy or, or legislation comes out, people are, are, you know, kind of nervous about what that means for their industry, right? Yeah. I saw a lot of hospitals start to cut ancillary services. Um, other things, you know, bring in-house, but um, things like administrative fellowships were becoming extremely competitive. Um, at the time, if not just eliminated at, at certain places um, that historically had been able to offer that kind of uh, position. So mm -hmm. uh, my class ended up starting to look elsewhere. Um, and I think in terms of career diversity, uh, we were the first class to really have to branch out um, due to necessity. So a lot of folks ended up in insurance. A lot of people ended up in consulting uh, as mm -hmm. well. So that was kind of a um, something that was kind of forced on us rather than something we chose. But like I said, it wasn't something that was really um, presented to us as a career path. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, become a healthcare focused consultant. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really anything um, that we were told about. Um, so, you know, coming out, I still didn't know, say, for example, what KPMG or PWC or anybody did. I didn't know what McKinsey was. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know what a case interview was, which was <laughs> interesting. One of my buddies, um, my buddy Rocky, um, I was really excited Um to be interviewing for this uh, boutique consulting uh, firm, McBee, in the very beginning. And uh, my buddy Rocky, who was already working for Hitachi, mm -hmm. um, I asked him, I said, you know, so what can I expect from the interview? He's like, so how, how's your casing? I'm like, what the fuck is casing? And he was <laughs> like, oh, God. Um, so I ended up driving down from Philly to D.C. Um, yeah. one night. And, uh, you know, he just kind of drilled me as best as he could and tried to prepare me for... Um, the casing, which didn't end up, uh, didn't end up happening, right? They didn't uh, do that, so mm -hmm. I was lucky. But you know, for for Deloitte and uh, you know, for other interviews, of course, that was a thing. I mean, that's yeah. a standard, right? Um, so I do, I do have a lot of gratitude for Rocky um, to kind of spend that at least one night to try to, you know, familiarize me with uh, with that whole concept. Um, but that's basically how so, it So started. all it took was one night. That, that was your introduction and ending about case interviews. Yeah, that's that's all I had. <laughs> um, late, well, later on, it didn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. Because like, so so case interviewing, ugh. Um, there are people who built their entire career off teaching or supposedly being able to teach you a method to how to crack these cases, right? Yep. And, um, you know, I think that there's merit to it, right? Um, in the sense that, if you're coming as just a straight undergrad, like, you know, say, say or you're coming out of grad school with, you know, no actual consultative experience, yep. right? Um, there's no other way to teach people methodically, um, you know, A, B, and C, how to, how to approach this case, right? But once you've been consulting for, you know, nearly a decade, you just walk into the room and it's just like, okay, this is what I've, you know, what I've dealt with. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I'm going to pull from real world examples because, there, there wouldn't be a time, I think, or any example um, or any case question that could be pulled that I couldn't draw parallels for my career at yeah. that point, right? So, yeah, when I went to Deloitte, I had, what, seven and a half years under my belt. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the case, I was extremely nervous for it. Don't get me wrong. But then once I started talking through it, I was like, oh, okay, okay. So, yeah. you know, it's not that much different from just being in a client situation.
right? Exactly. Um, but you can't, I mean, you, you can teach kind of how to do this mechanically, but not really, you know, come to the table and, and I guess, convince people that you have a lot of experience doing this if, if you don't, right? Yeah, no. But, and, and um, but that's how, I mean, that's how the case has worked out for me. I, I know it doesn't uh, necessarily work out that way for everybody, but yeah, no, I didn't study very much for those cases at all. No, it's a, uh, it's, actually. it's a unique, um, um, I guess, experience that you had, because as you know, people spend millions of dollars collectively, right? Prepping for case interviews. And they, I don't, I don't know the dollar amount behind this industry, but I'm, I'm quite sure it's substantial. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And then it's, it's teaching you three month courses, two month courses, 50 video courses, right. I'm sure there's dedicated, uh, Instagram and social media channels, YouTube channels, right. Just cracking the case. Right. Yeah. I remember when I, uh, when I was interviewing for Accenture, I, I bought this packet for 35 bucks called, uh, the consulting Bible. And it was ran by mm-hmm. some folks at the management dot management consulted, the management consulted, um, website back in the day. I don't know if it still exists, but that was your go-to source for management consulting. And, and it yeah, was- I think Victor Chang, I don't know if you've heard that name before. I have. Before. Um, <laughs> I, I hear a lot about his stuff. Um, I actually listened to a little bit of his material um, okay. on the plane um, over to Pittsburgh when I was about to interview for Deloitte. Okay. Um, and I get it. I mean, I like I said, I don't think that, you know, it's something that lacks merit or value. I think there's absolutely value in it. Um, just having gone through the experience myself, I'm like, okay, well, if I had no concept of this um, at all, or you yeah. know, I, I I wasn't good at putting my ideas together and things like that um, in a reproducible way, right? Yep. Um, yep. Then this would be really really useful for me. Just like every interview guide, right? Um, some people are just naturally really adept at you know distilling their core ideas and communicating them really effectively, right? If mm-hmm. that's not something that you're naturally gifted at yeah of course you need you need some kind of framework, need a framework. yeah exactly exactly, exactly. And, yeah. and without that you know you're, you're kind of dead in the water no you, you summarize it quite well and I, I do think it's targeted for folks that don't have exposure to real the real world right or or or, or anything consultative in any capacity with a client or, or a boss or whomever um and and it's it's interesting because i've seen the dynamic with experienced hires interviewing them versus um undergrad Right. Uh, and you could tell folks that are really, you know, they've uh, they've gobbled up everything from these uh, courses and, and they're sort of using a framework step by step and, and saying it out loud to make me hear. <laughs> I, I, well. I, I think this is kind of nice. I it mean, is. Because it, it, it shows, shows preparation. Exactly. And I absolutely appreciate that, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's good. And, and it, it, it certainly helps. Right. I could certainly tell yeah. those that you know, they may be overdoing it, but the methodology works. You're, you're yeah. breaking down the problems. You're, you're, you're testing hypotheses, right? You're sort of getting some data out of me and, and sort of having a conversation. All those yeah. are things you have to do, right? It may come naturally once you've spent a decade or seven years or whatever in industry to whatever capacity. But if you're fresh out of undergrad, especially if you're an engineering or a, a medical student trying to break into consulting, very difficult to do. There's no course that I went through that even taught me how to communicate the right way. Right. Uh, so I think it's set up for that. So, so, uh, okay. So you, you, uh, you flew down, got, uh, got consulted about case interviews. Um, it worked out in your favor and now yeah. talk us through the, the rest. How did you end up? At Deloitte? Uh, uh, so, you know, I was, I was at my firm McBee for what, like seven and a half years or so. Okay. Um, and it's just about time. I think, um, I wanted to experience what big four, had to offer um especially at that time i think i've had been making memes for about um a year or so right um and what i realized from that experience was you know people you know will talk the talk about big four or mckinsey um although i'll exclude mckinsey out of there because i don't have any direct experience over there um but the point is that from I guess the core consultative model, we all kind of experience the same things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, especially, I mean, if you're from a, from a firm, I should probably point that out, that I'm exclusively talking about, uh, you know, folks that work at a firm, at a big firm or a small firm, but basically not independent consultants, right? Yep, yep. Um, they pretty much have the same experiences. Um, and a lot of that bleeds through to other professional services as well, but especially for consulting, um, it did kind of dawn on me, um, you know, about a year in, I was like, Hey, you know what? Um, 
I had been thinking about whether my experiences were translatable or valid. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you're when you're at uh, a boutique firm, um, or something that may lack the, you know, the the global prestige as uh you know like deloitte or pwc or ey um you really start to question yourself right mm. and i think that 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 happens um it's kind of a natural reaction right so if, is is what i'm doing correct if there was ever a correct thing yeah. to do in consulting right is my approach sound um is everything that i've been doing for the last seven and a half years like will is this like the right thing to do? You know, um, is there any credibility to it whatsoever? And there were questions that were kind of starting to frighten me, right? Mm. Because you don't know. I mean, if you're, you're, your focus is very narrow and your experience is very narrow, you kind of don't know what's outside those walls. And compounded by the fact that there is a kind of uh, mystique that surrounds Big Four and, and MBB, right? Um, especially for people on the outside. It's this yeah. great thing, and it is an achievement. I I, I don't want to, um, you know, take that away from anybody. Um, you know, getting into any of these very selective firms, I think, is is an achievement unto itself. However, you know, looking in from the outside and not really knowing what to expect, um, you know, there's a bit of fear and trepidation that comes with that. Mm. But again, on the other side, I, I thought to myself, hey, look, like if the memes that I'm making are resonating across the board uh, with, you know, with big four folks and Accenture and, you know, kind of everybody alike, then maybe I am good enough. Maybe my experiences do uh, matter and, and, and we'll see. Right. So that's mm. kind of one of the reasons why I decided to, to branch out a little bit um, to kind of test myself. Um, and of course, also validate myself and make sure that what I was doing was worthwhile um, and, you know, had value. So I was very, very happy um, when when I got my offer from Deloitte. It was it was a great day. Right? I I could certainly imagine, but I, so it, it's it, just to uh, expand on that a little bit. It, it sounds like your ship from McBee um, and sort of boutique going into Deloitte or or your target for a big four was predominantly driven by the hunger or the desire to convince and prove to yourself that you could play that game at, at a higher, you know, at higher stakes table uh, rather um, than maybe, or maybe it's something else, or rather than typically when people jump, it's because either um, they don't see growth within that firm, right? Or they're not compensated for the level of work that they're doing, or there's better opportunities that just present themselves. But you sort of, it was an intentional proactive move to, to, to prove to yourself, right? That, that you can do it. Yeah. And I wonder when that's going to stop. Right. Um, I think, I think it's in, hopefully never. Know, it's, <laughs> wow. it's a, it's a good, I, I mean, think about it, right. It's, it's self-actualization at, at its purest where you're trying to, obviously you're, you're always trying to succeed. It's brand worshiping. I mean, it's like, I don't know. It'd be, it'd be great. I think, you know, to just say, okay, well, this is good enough for me because I know it's, it's good enough. I don't need any kind of external bar to um, validate to show yourself. otherwise. But no, I, I don't think that's how my mind operates, right? Yeah. And keep shooting higher and higher and just say, okay, say if I'm making it into McKinsey and uh, I'm able to operate at that level, then I'll feel happy and satisfied. Um, I don't know. I don't know where that, where that level is. And uh, of course, right now, you know, kind of just in between figuring out whether I want to be in consulting, um, for the rest of my life or not, right? Um, I think that the landscape has changed in such a way, obviously you can see behind me that, you know, I have these big <laughs> up, right? Um, the landscape has changed, uh, you know, due to this uh, pandemic uh, in mm -hmm. such a way where there's a lot of questions about, are we going to maintain the same business model that we had before, right? Travel being a huge part of it. Um, yeah. And to be honest with you, you know, I. I I hear stuff from from all levels, right? And a lot of people are saying, okay, well, you know, it gives me some stability and it's awesome. Like I'm kind of in that boat, right? So if it gives me stability and time to be with my family, that's awesome, right? But now if I'm thinking, if I put myself in the shoes of like a 22 year old, right? Where are my hotel points? Where mm -hmm. are my mm -hmm. airline points? Um, you know, how is this different than anything else except I'm getting worked to death at home 
yeah. uh, remotely. There's no fringe perks um, or anything that used to come with uh, the glamour. Yeah, exactly. And it was huge. The, I, the I think charm was and the glamour. Motivation, uh, Absolutely. For people, young people, especially young people. Um, and that consulting firms at the time would never, ever uh, not have a supply of eager young folks to work for them. But yeah, I'm starting to hear now from people. And I think these are legitimate, um, you know, concerns like, well, why? Like, and to be honest with you, it's not like consulting pays the best. It pays great. It pays great for the amount of knowledge that you uh, <laughs> that you have. So yeah, I mean, like, I guess that's the idea, right? You know, you get these pretty bright kids that don't know much about anything, but they work really hard and they're really bright. So you just have to believe that they're going to work out better than what the client has, right? And I think that's probably a good way to summarize how consultancy works, um, especially at the at the starting levels, right? Well, that that's the model, right? Where you right, you, yeah. you 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 cast a wide net, right? Try to get as much as you can, and knowing that there's going to be some very few percentile that will be the polished uh, gems uh, that, that you are going after. And most will leave. Others will sort of get transitioned out. And all, all of that will happen. Um, but but I, sorry, just to take a step back to something you've said that sort of struck a note. Why, why do you think, you know, that is where, you know, folks like yourself and others are not satisfied, right, with, with the achievements that they sought after so so diligently, right, throughout their progression, right? You, you wanted to be Deloitte or you wanted to start it, you know, jump from medicine, biology to consulting. You did that, you did that. You're going on and on and on. Is it, is it in the psychology of a certain type of personality and, and consulting tends to attract that or? I, th I think that's a part of it, um, <clears throat> you know, to, uh, I think it would be safe to say that uh, consulting does attract a certain type of personality that has something to prove, that's hungry to prove something and get recognition, right? Mm. No matter how hard they work, um, you know, just to make sure that, you know, they prove themselves and others that they are smart and talented and are worth something, right? Um, in my personal psychology, I just want to like, just say, okay, well, you know, it's cause, you know, both my parents are doctors, I'm not a doctor. So <laughs> like, I have to, I have to uh, find yeah. some other ways to, you know, prove that whatever I'm spending my time doing is, is worthwhile, right? Not only to myself, yeah. but to them. And I think that's a big part of, I don't know, just Asian or immigrant psychology. Um, that's something yeah. that I think no matter how old I get, I mean, the relationship with your parents always stays the same. I mean, mm -hmm. I was actually trying to tell somebody much younger than me uh, about this, this kind of dynamic, right? Because, you know, I think she was, she was kind of uh, nervous on how to send an email. She was wanting to know, She's like 15 years old and wants to know about being an actuary. It's weird, right? But I'm not an actuary. You're, I have a friend yeah. who is. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know, just send this guy an email, right? And she's like, I, I like, we don't know how to write emails. Collectively, our generation doesn't know how to write emails. So I'm like, you kid. all right, just like, just write the email. Like, yeah, yeah. you're DMing me right now. And I'm like twice your age. So it, like, I don't know, this, this relationship is it just in your head. This construct of adult versus child is just in your yes. head. And it's not like, you know, when, you know, I deal with people that are twice my age, I'm like, you know, Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so, like that doesn't exist in the real world. It doesn't. But the only relationship that's going to maintain and be like that forever is going to be you and your parents. That's it. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, just a lot to say that, you know, I think that no matter how old I get that desire to validate myself in front of my parents is never going to change. I mean, even it, as aware of it as I am, it's not something that I think I can break out of because it's just something that's just been, you know, hardwired in me. Yeah. Hardwired in a lot of folks um, uh, in my circumstance anyway. No, I agree. I agree. And, and maybe the the first generation, the immigrant what, um, mentality, whatever you want to call it, but I 100% I agree with you. There, there's a part of my brain as well, right? As I said, first generation uh, background from Pakistan it's always telling me that do do more, right? Or you could be more, right? There's always a higher bar that you have to you have to you have to hit, and then there's something higher. And and I too am lost in in, in a lot of the sense, and I'm I'm feeling that from you as well. It's like at what point do you say, I'm I'm content, right? Um, yeah, and it's not something that anybody can tell you or anybody can show you, right? Yeah, because you know they can say, well, you you know you you've done good by any measure of success. And you're just like, well, what does that mean? 
and you can't make yourself believe that right if you if you don't actually right so it's not yeah. something i think it's a struggle that you know it's just gonna we're gonna bear for the rest of our lives but it just, it's just <laughs> like that um i don't think it's a problem it's just it's just a fact right it's a it's mindset a exactly yeah. it's just fact circumstances and and you know it's neither good nor bad but you just kind of have to understand understand <laughs> that this is just your condition Right. Now, is that something you also um, you try to proactively avoid with your kids, right? To to not they're too, give them they're, they're that too pressure. Young right now, they're too okay. young right now. It doesn't matter. Okay, okay. Man. I mean, like yeah. whatever. My kids are going to be famous. <laughs> they're going to take care of us in our old age. <laughs> yes, yes. That is the forget the four hundred one k's. Right. That's that's true retirement. That's the um, investment. That's the that's real the investment. investment. Right. Right. Invest in your kids. But uh, so do you, do you think that mentality and, and the mentality to never quit and always be one step better or, or, you know, go to the higher bar translated into your day to day at work where we never shut off, right? It's, it's, a, it's a fight and it's a, it's a challenge to continue working no matter what the damage is to work life balance. Um, I think there are people who do it smarter and therefore are more successful at it. Mm -hmm. I think that taking that for face value, like just being this, you know, extremely over the top driver mentality um, will not get you what you want mm. most of the time. Right. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of emotional intelligence that goes into it and certainly not something that I've been blessed with. Um, but, you know, as I've worked uh, throughout the years, you know, it's it's clearly not about who works the hardest, um, but also, you know, there has to be a selectivity in terms of the type of the type of work that you're willing to take on. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you want to be that go to person um, that, you know, your SM or MD really trusts to get the work done, but not for everything. Um, and, you know, there has to be a shrewdness about how that's approached. I think consulting hires for those types of people that just really want to get it done no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think a lot of the landscape is starting to change. And I know a lot of firms will say, okay, you know, they care about mental health and, and whatever. Um, but the truth of the matter is the firm has no control over that. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you can't say that, you know, Oh, you know, Deloitte has better work-life balance. I haven't joked about it. Like, you know, or KPMG does or whatever. It's, you can't say that because you know how each project works. It's it's what type of project it is. It's who's leading the project and yeah. what expectations yeah. either the client themselves uh, have or you know your leadership has, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you can work with some really great people or you can work with some really toxic people, and it could be from the same firm, right? So there's no blanket statement that can say you know well. And I always see people say this, well, in my experience, you know, this has never happened. Like, so for example, in reaction to people getting treated poorly at the big four, right? Mm -hmm. Like you'd have to be, I don't know, like you just have to be stupid to assume that it never happens. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like you, ha you have to be cognizant of the fact that if it doesn't happen to you, even if it doesn't happen to you, right, that plausibly somebody could have a bad experience. Right. Um, but I see people just saying, well, this has never happened to me. And so what you're saying about being treated poorly or whatever, this is just you, like, this is something you're doing to yourself or what I'm like, all right, well, that's just kind of, you drank the Kool-Aid all the way. And there's a really shitty thing to say, um, mm -hmm. about something that could very well happen to you. You just haven't experienced it yet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but in any case, I mean, I think that because we hire for this type of thing, uh, this type of personality, right. Um, everybody's going to have to kind of come to terms with themselves on, you know, how long they want to stay in um, an industry that kind of operates this way, regardless yeah. of what, you know, the, the feel good uh, type stuff that the firm puts out about mental health awareness and whatever, right. Or telling their employees to learn how to say no, or, or even, mm -hmm. you know, the training mm -hmm. that goes into it. I have no doubt that the firms themselves, at least whoever's coming up with this, um, is genuine in in the fact that they want to improve work life balance. But when it comes to crunch time, when you need something done, when the client gives you an 11th hour request, there yeah. all that goes out the window anyway, right? Yep. yep. Um, kind of putting a parallel on what I'm seeing um, out there right now, like with Cyberpunk 20, uh, 2077, right? CD Projekt mm -hmm. Red uh, instituted uh, crunch time, right? Uh, right before their game release. So this game was released on December 10th and was a 
highly delayed, uh, but highly anticipated game. And they were working their folks seven days a week, uh, mm. like, you know, over 12 hours a day, something like that. Right. And I thought to myself, well, you know, this is just kind of a media spin on it because crunch time is not something that development people are unfamiliar with. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're in development, um, pre go live. Oh yeah. It's, it's normal. Right. But what does that mean? Like it, it, it's normal for the industry, but extremely unhealthy to, um, to its workers and the people that actually, you know, that operate this industry. Yeah. You know, there's going to be a breaking point, um, at some point. And I think a lot of it has to do with the money. Um, that's going to dictate a lot of it because, you know, you pay enough, you pay people enough to kind of keep them happy to yeah. say that what I'm doing is worth it, right? The amount of work that I'm doing is worth it. Um, but again, with the visibility of other ex opportunities as well as consulting, people aren't stupid. They're going to be able to do that, you know, yep. that math in their head and say, okay, well, you know, whatever is important to them, whether it be pay or autonomy or less work, um, whatever that is, there are an infinite number of options at this point. Yeah. Um, where you could pivot your skill set from consultancy, right? So, I mean, I think that's one of the big draws of consultancy itself is that you can you can take your skill set and you know go from say a very prestigious firm to anything else that you might want to do with the rest yep. of your life, right? Yep. But at the time, you're going to struggle with am am I being paid enough for the amount of work that I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's something that everybody kind of comes has to come to terms with. I think it's responsible for a lot of people saying, okay, well, now I'm a manager. Now I'm a senior manager. Like, am I going to go, you know, the MD track or am I going to jump ship and do something else? Right. And I think yeah. that it's not like, I don't think people should feel bad about that. I think it's just natural. Right. Yeah. And it comes back to who are you competing with? Are you competing right. with yourself? Are you competing with your peer? Are you competing with some person out there? Like who, who is it that you are trying to uh, satisfy at the end of the day. And, and we have to be real to that, right? A lot of the folks that just gun it and become that toxic personality that you're explaining, I, I think tend to be those go-getters that have one track mind that I, it's me and I have to be successful. Nothing else matters. And the success may mean more money or the next title up, right? And that's, that's their goal. That's what they chase. Um, so, so what type of work did you do at Deloitte when you started? kind of all over the place, actually. Um, my specialty has been healthcare revenue cycle. Uh, okay. Although I've been staffed on quite a few projects that just had nothing to do with that. Um, <laughs> so I can't really even say like there's any specific type, although I would also say like management consulting process improvement, um, operations transformation. I okay. think that's probably a good generalization kind of been bounced around um on a variety of different projects um yeah i mean i i can't really say one way or another right so i was well, let me I was let me in... let me ask it a different way i guess um you had a high regard for the big four you got into the mm -hmm. big four has your uh experience been up to the mark that you had expected or was wow. it sort of still trying to figure it out well, I don't think I should say. <laughs> you said enough. I will, I will say. I will say this. Um, I think perception perception is reality, right? Okay. Um, whether that's building a perception of skills, uh, prestige, um, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it might be. It's a lot of smoke and mirrors, and mm. I'm not saying this exclusively of Deloitte. I'm saying this of everybody, right? Yeah. Um, everybody, I mean, everybody screws up at some point, right? Yeah. Um, but it's like the amount of money that some clients are paying. I just, you know, I look at some of these um, these pricing models, and I'm just like, holy, holy crap. Like this is, this is absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. um, so is the value there? I don't know. I actually don't know. Um, could they do it themselves? No, definitely not. Um, so I don't know. I'm still kind of in between. It's like, it's like there's definitely no way that the client being as they are right now has either the human capital, just the sheer numbers or the skill yeah, set yeah. to complete something like this. Now, is it fair for the money? I don't think so. I don't mm -hmm. think so, but it's a moot point, 
right? To me, it's kind of like, you know, well, yes, it's expensive, but I don't care. Like you have no other option. So I don't know, you can either hire for the talent, which is not going to be possible, uh, say within your geographic region, right? Or you can just hire us to get the job done. Mm. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm super disillusioned with it. I mean, again, I think that it's it's a solution. It's probably the only solution that some of these clients have in order to get something done to transform um, their organization to, you know, hit financial goals or growth goals, right? Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I I I think that we get a lot of flack now because people are finally starting to realize how much money they're paying um, for these things to happen. Right? Yeah. I'm almost almost divorced of the you know of the value again. Like I've I've seen so many news articles that said, oh well, you're paying, you know, this firm X millions of dollars to do something, whatever it might be. Yeah, right? yeah. And then I I think about it, I'm like, wow, no, that's actually not a lot of money. Um, you know, like it's just completely taking out of context on what they're providing, um, mm -hmm. versus what they're paying the money for. Yeah. But I don't know. Like, it's just. Do you? Uh, so I I. I also think about that, right? Because once you once you get to a certain level, you start seeing the numbers and and um, some of these uh, requests that are coming in as RFPs from the clients and all that. But I I can't help but also think that the system and I include the client in the system and their corporate structures and their IT departments and their you know COOs and all of that. They're they're set up in a way to utilize whatever budget that they get because that leader also has to show their worth in some sure. regard, right? So it's not that it, it's a it, it's a self-fulfilling system, right? Where yeah. yes, you may be paying the consultants a higher uh, a dollar amount or whatever currency than that value that you make extract from it. But then the request from the clients also that this funds and these things have to be utilized because that's how sure. we transform. And, and absolutely, if I went into industry and you know I had budget left over, um, to right? accomplish a certain task, I would hire Deloitte. I'd be like, okay, yeah, sure. Like, you know, yep, guys come yep. in. I know you guys uh, are good at this. I've I've done this with you guys. So let's do it. Have yeah. the money to do it. And you know what? If you guys fail, I'm going to bring you guys under the bus. However, <laughs> however, however, if you guys do well, then, you know, both of us are, are going to exactly. benefit from it, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, and you're absolutely right. The the system absolutely facilitates this, this kind of cycle, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, you, you can't accomplish it on your own. Yeah. Uh, and there's, I guess you're paying for some amount of reliability because look, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, big four is better than non big four um, at anything. Right. Mm -hmm. I can't really say that. I can't say that, sit here and say that, oh, well, you know, Deloitte consultants are better than, you know, PWs or, or KPMG for that matter. Um, like, it's that's just a dumb thing to say because everybody has really talented people working for them um and you know it just kind of it kind of goes left and right and i i always think it's kind of funny when people try to compare the value of their firm based on just what the name is it makes <laughs> no absolutely no sense to me um and it's just a kind of a silly thing I think I was at the more junior say. ranks. I, I I seldom see it at I, I don't know maybe you've seen it at a higher rank, but I think that sort of perception and that sort of cheerleading and drinking the Kool Aid dies out very quickly, you know, at maybe the manager level or maybe even senior consultant level. Like I I don't know I I don't see it anymore. I think everyone is uh, at the higher levels trying to figure out like what their next move is, right? Yeah. Whether it's like how do I make it to the next level? How do I don't get fired, right? Especially in yeah. this economy, or how do I um, how do I exit out? Which is again three yeah. three very plausible and and, and uh, options that can happen. Um, yeah. and it's very true. A lot of people, um, you know, will gun for it, and a lot of people will make that jump. Yeah. Happens all the way. Yeah. So so how um, you're you're in Deloitte? Um, how do you break it to them, or how, do you break it to your colleagues and and folks that, you know, when you do two truths and a lie, is your your fact uh, and your truths that hey, I run this very very successful. Social media, no, I'll probably just get channel. Drunk happy hour and say. <laughs> so, what are the reactions? So, when you tell people that's you, what what are the reactions? It's just like anything, man. Like, if if you think that there's value in it, you'll be impressed. If you don't, then you don't, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like okay, so uh, take me three years ago. If you're like, oh, you know, I highly successful in social media, I'm like, 
good for you. Like, yeah, yeah, right. Um, no, if you, if you think it's important, then then fine. If you don't, then you don't. And so it's it's kind of in this strange place right now hmm. um, because people at at your level, right? So so senior managers and directors, right? Like they're it's it's shifting, right? A lot of them do use social media now, yeah, right? In a way that, of course, you know like one academic generation back or one, you know, um, professional level back, like this wouldn't have been a thing, right? Yeah. So very soon you're going to start to get, you know, directors, MDs, and that, you know, that population being very familiar with, um, with social media and kind of growing up throughout it. Right. So the core demographic right now is, you know, on Instagram is, is 25 to 34. Um, okay. that's kind of where the bulge is in terms of the following. Right. But if you really think about the, upper echelon of that. So, you know, in your thirties, it's, it, it's ostensible that you'd be a senior manager or director at that point, right? Some very successful, um, you know, mid 30 year old directors out there, um, for sure. Mm -hmm. But that, that landscape of leadership is going to change uh, 100%. very quickly. Right. And, and um, so I think it's, it's really interesting um, from that perspective where this account might go and what influence it might have in the future. Right. So right now I'm seeing a reach of a bit over a million every week. Right. So every seven days it's reaching a million people right? or, or, or more sometimes. So what does that mean in the future? Um, yeah. Advertisers have definitely kind of jumped on the meme boat at this point. I'm sure you've seen Bud Light, um, mm -hmm. you know, folks like Wendy's, uh, even Microsoft is, um, you know, trying to use those kind of tactics to appeal to younger users. And yeah. frankly, it works. Um, if it didn't work, they wouldn't invest the amount of money that they do mm -hmm. in uh, social media and, and that's right. Sorry. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I don't know what that means for for the future in terms of, you know, how people uh, will receive um, content like this. Again, I don't think it works on on people that are older because this is just not something that resonates with them. I, I agree. Um, yeah. Right. And I, but, I, but I, but I also agree that I think to your point, I, I have more examples than I could count where memes that you've created and some of the peer groups that you mentioned at the beginning have created, have been shared with clients, internal teams. Right. And, and, and it's becoming more and more prominent and it's even going up to some leadership who you have a good relationship oh, yeah. with. Right. And yeah, people enjoy that, it's, it's, it's all fed from that middle group. Right. The, it is. Uh, the, it is. The 25 to 34. Right. Um, yeah, I've, have heard that, um, there, there was this one meme, um, that was posted on Twitter about, you know, kind of waiting, uh, for, uh, a Deloitte recruiter or on the phone with the Deloitte recruiter and me saying, don't say it, don't say it. <laughs> now that's a true story. Um, that's a true story of me waiting in my car at a client site, waiting for the recruiter to call me up for the Deloitte interview. Yeah. I was just really nervous and I, you know, didn't know what to expect. I was just sitting in my car. I was at a client site at the time. So, you know, I just took lunch, ran out to the parking yeah. lot, sat in my yeah. car. Um, and I was really nervous. So I just, I was just like, haha, this would be cute. I think, um, you know, maybe they wouldn't stop talking to me immediately if I said this. So, uh, so that's the origin of that. Um, well, did you say it? No, uh. I, actually, I did want the job. So <laughs> imagine Not that cavalier. Yeah, yeah. That that's how you your first conversation with any recruiter or any leadership at Deloitte started. Deloitte. Yeah, I mean it you. could go one or two ways, but I'm not here to make that gamble. Yeah, you know, no. It could be like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Exit. But, you know. That's it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, I have a buddy of mine who recently uh, jumped ship from Accenture to Deloitte, and every meme I see that's that's putting Deloitte down. I I again I I highly regard all the big four. You know, we have to put this caveat throwing myself out there in social media. But every every meme that I get that's putting his firm down, I share it right away, right? Yeah. Especially the one that deloaded to me. Yeah. I was like, how many times have you said that? <laughs> you have <laughs> it's the policy that you have to say it at least four times a week, or else you're fired. Well, even PwC, um, right? There's this uh, on the the Reddit, the consulting Reddit, right? There's this this video that goes around of uh, new recruits doing the I forget yeah. the shabanga dance or something, just mm. walking around. Oh my god secondhand cringe when, when you there's when always you, going to be that cringe I, I you know like yeah uh, firms coming up with songs and and that yeah. sort of thing it's, i mean i get it i, I get it fine. that there was like, someone in in uh hr or someone who thought about this as being the great idea to break the ice but in reality it's like ah mm. yeah not not what you want to do
Yeah. And you know, speaking of which, you know, I, I have gotten the distinct feeling that, you know, especially with the image of, of KPMG, that there's been a lot of like memes going around <laughs> about KPMG kind of, you know, being the odd person out or odd firm out in the big four. And I can say definitively that it's not true. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, I think people take the, the memes out of context quite a bit um, in the sense that, you know, I think that in the consultancy side, and I really do need to stress this about the consultancy side versus the audit and accounting, because, yeah. you know, like, if we talk about audit and accounting, then Deloitte can't even compare to KPMG. I mean, the majority, I think, of the audit clients are owned basically between KPMG and EY, right? Yeah. So Deloitte doesn't even have a place in that conversation, right? But on the consultancy side, on the other hand, you know, um, KPMG is kind of regarded as, you know, the little brother, right? So you kind of get picked <laughs> on. But I do want to take this opportunity to say that, like, for those of you who like are not applying to KPMG because of the per this perception, right? Y'all are absolutely crazy. Like that's just stupid. I've heard of 100%. people doing that, saying like, "Oh well, you know, I don't even want to, you know, oh no, I got this offer letter from KPMG." If you guys are seriously thinking, you know, because the memes are are changing the perceived value of, of this firm, then that's crazy. You know, I think that's that there's a like there's it's parody, right? Um, and there's we like to poke fun at certain things like, you know, McKinsey slaughtering younglings or something like that. Like that's definitely, I've seen, I, you know, I made that and I've seen that around the internet so much. Yeah. Uh, most, mostly uncredited, but it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing I want to talk about too, because I think that a lot of the perception, like a lot of these things come without context. Right. And I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, the firm's, and I'm not just talking about McKinsey, I'm talking about everybody. Um, don't engage in like morally questionable engagements or clients, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and I had posted this question earlier and I'm still not really sure where I stand, but you know, if, if say for example, um, you believe that the consulting firms should be held up to the same moral scrutiny as what their clients do, then, mm -hmm. Okay, so your federal practices drop all Department of Defense contracts, right? What are you going to do? You're going to drop all big oil, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, which you know, I, I don't think is a stretch of the imagination to say that they do some pretty questionable, fair point, or just fair even point. outright evil things. So where do you draw the line in terms of advisory? Well, you know, when I hear this stuff come out about McKinsey, I'm also thinking to myself, well, this is like the context of this is just not there. Um, a lot of these articles are sensationalized in a way that you know tries to tie McKinsey to an outcome that they're not really a part of. But I think mm. this is true of, of, of all consulting, right? 100%. Especially if they're, especially if they're in an advisory um, capacity. Now, implementation is a little bit different, but if you're there to strategize and, you know, you're, you're put there to give a portfolio of options to the client, yeah. right? Yeah. That's it. That's your, that's your role, right? Yep. Being boots on the ground and, you know, bringing some of these things to fruition, I think would be, extremely uh questionable and um i think firms do offer a way out for folks that you know have any moral qualms with what they're doing yeah yeah but for at the sure same time the work is going to get done so i don't know like i'm still kind of on the fence about that like where do you draw the line no no i, I agree and i i i also again i this may sound a little bit extreme but i also think the f there's definitely a group of people that are genuine right with that mindset right there's a moral mm -hmm. compass that's right and they see that as like no right? Whether they may be in consulting or outside of consulting. I think a lot of that population who does make noise are, again, generalizing here. So apologies in advance, but there, there's a little bit of um, not, not jealousy or, or uh, you're in awe of the firm or something else. And, and it's sort of like putting them down to make yourself feel comfortable with your position and what you do. And, and as humans, we tend to do that, right? You, you want to, you see something grand and you want it, or you want to be part of it, or you want to be associated with it, but you can't. So you try to find ways to downplay it, right? And that happens sometimes. And I have seen real examples of that, but certainly. Because you know, always still like kind of misunderstood, I think. Yeah. Yeah. From the general public, no, no matter how much visibility it gets, it just goes back to the main question, what is consulting? Like, how would you explain consulting to somebody that doesn't have a concept of it? How would you explain it to your family? Um, and you find it. <laughs> How would it's, you? <laughs> it's, I don't. Um, 
although since my, my family's in medicine, they have a extreme distaste for uh, consultants in their space, right? It's like, who are these kids telling me uh, how to do my job? Yeah, uh, I, I, <laughs> know, I get it, I did it. I feel the same way, you know? But if you had to, if you had to define consulting to uh, someone who wasn't aware or wanted to break in, how would you, what would, how would you put that into words? After everything you've seen and been through and you sort of sensationalized with your memes, I'd what's the net net? Cons- consulting is a, it's not a, well, it is a convoluted pension plan. It's extremely, uh, <laughs> no, but you know what? I, I would say that it's um, convoluted the pension company plan. hedging their bets that somebody with no knowledge, but extremely good problem solving skills will be better than what is in place at the client at that particular time. I think mm. that's probably it. Mm. Um, Cause what, what else would it be? Um, if I had to summarize it in one sentence, I don't know how else I would. That's just what it is. Um, obviously there's shades of nuance. But, but, but is, is no, is it no knowledge a little bit intense? Right. Or or like, what do you mean by no No, knowledge? No, I don't think it, I don't think it is intense because, you know, you have, and I'm not talking about like the senior manager, you're you're talking about like people who are just getting into consulting. Me explaining that that's kind of, that's the population I'm trying to describe at this point. Right. (laughs) Because look, like after, after a certain number of years, it's almost like you can, it's almost like a matter of reflex, Mm -hmm. Um, especially in, in, you know, a field like healthcare revenue cycle for me, like, you know, it's, it's interesting, interesting to a certain point, but after you've seen so many things go wrong, right. Um, you come to a new client and you're like, yeah, no, I've seen that before. Okay. Exactly. We're going to do like, you already have a game plan because you've seen this particular problem to a T and I'm not saying a problem like this problem. I'm saying this exact problem over and over again, because it's Mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, a pitfall that people fall into, um, operating their organizations. Right. I'm not saying like, I'm saying exactly the same. And so once you build out that, you know, that index of experience, you become a force to be reckoned with, right? Like you come into an organization, you review their financial metrics and their ops and you're just like, yeah, no, I, I already know. I already know what yeah, you guys need yeah. to do. So just like, you know, just help, help us uh, work with you to come, come up with a work plan and get this thing going. Right. So no, there's value in that. Right. But when you're starting out, like, I don't care you're coming directly out of grad school, you're coming out of Harvard Business School or whatever, right? And you know, you get placed in whatever project, you know about that project and whatever <laughs> academic knowledge that you can ascertain before you get on the client, um, yeah, yeah. client site, like that's, that's not I, I, I 100% agree with you. Yeah, there, there's yeah, very but, limited. But the, the idea is that, you know, we're betting that you're a better problem solver that you can understand the nuance and you can distill these core these core concepts into something that's actionable right that's what we're looking for um, yeah and if we don't have that then we have nothing then consultancy has nothing um, yeah no I, I agree i agree and it, it, that in a group setting right that you have yeah. the right talent somewhere within that team that you've constructed and everyone plays a key role and you'll, you'll be able to put it all together mm-hmm. at the end of the day yeah yeah but in the beginning it's it's extremely you know it's extremely difficult to to convince people that you know that not only we're not only the um, you know your best choice but also the most knowledgeable and this and that. And I know we get billed as that, but I think it's kind of silly to um, to really believe in that. You know, I, I do see people kind of really buy into that notion. I think it's kind of silly. Yeah, yeah no, I agree. I agree, and I think uh, clients are much smarter now. Right? They'll they'll eat that. They'll um, they'll call that bullshit very quickly. Right. There's no way that someone you think so. Just don't let them talk to the analysts. Right? Well, that, that's my point. That's my point. Right. Yeah, like if, if you're an analyst or you're a new consultant and you're sitting there with the SVP, that guy who's ran the business for decades and you try to give them ideas and it's not maybe someone senior. I, I at least from the examples that I've been, I've, I've seen that question or it's, it's usually someone more senior talking to them. Right, not not sort of a person who maybe just tacitly taking notes, and now this person, the next meeting is leading that meeting and giving ideas. But the frameworks, yes, right, because yeah. they value the frameworks. They know that you're going to come in with a a way to think that they may not have or possess or have the time to do so, even if they did possess sure. it. Or even you're just a mediator. Um, you're yeah. saying an idea out loud that they already they already have. It's just that you know sometimes you need that third party to come in. It's like a marriage counselor, kind of like you need you need that <laughs> mediation sometimes. Um, to get things, uh, get things through. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So has, has your channel opened up new doors for you, whether it be partnerships or uh, newer opportunities, have folks reached out? And is that turning into a, uh, it's actually a, a, one of the biggest questions I've got. So I put out a post, like, what do you want me to ask you? One of them was like, you know, how, how are you balancing with uh, your day job and your, uh, your channel? But is this also getting you money? Uh, a little bit, but I don't think it's, um, it's enough to quit the day job, right? Um, no, I, I'm, I'm still kind of curious to see where it grows to hmm. kind of diversifying uh, the media as well. Uh, which is also tough because uh, it's tough to succeed in a medium of social media that get, that you're not familiar with. Like for yeah. example, I don't listen to podcasts. I never have. Um, so people have asked, asked me if I want to start up a podcast. I'm like, yeah, maybe if I, yeah. if I had a better concept of what it is. So that's kind of off the table. Um, it's always kind of a, a fear that because you don't own the platform, um, it's kind of like, what YouTube is going through right now um, yeah. and getting, you know, accounts banned and things like that. Um, in the most extreme case, for example, um, I've heard of people getting their entire Google account banned. What are you going to do without your Gmail account? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's wow. extremely frightening, but it's true of all the platforms that you don't own yourself. Right. Um, there's always, you're always operating under the risk that one day for any arbitrary reason that it can be taken away. Right? Yeah. Um, so those are kind of the things that are more top of mind to me rather than trying to make money is trying to secure um, the future of this in a way that is uh, a little bit more resistant um, hmm. to these type of things, right? So what, what diversifying is that? a media is yeah. probably the, you know, probably the most important step. Sorry, does that mean you're going cross channel into other things like Vimeo and and whatever YouTube? Um, is, well, getting the content to start up YouTube, um, I think would be really important. Mm. Um, visual media, I think, is also very okay. important. And and doing educational media has always been something that I've really wanted to do. Yeah. Um, but not really found the time um, to be able to pursue. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. But basically, I mean, the sh long and short of it is, is get out of Instagram as the only platform that you exist on, right? Mm. Um, even doing more speaking um, events and things like that, I think would be really fun. Um, I'm definitely not averse to uh, to doing that. Um, see, I've lost a ton of weight, so I'm not. I'm not <laughs> uh, man, I was huge. I was I was huge. I've lost like four. Oh, really? So this can, is this is can't even tell. Cannot even tell. And and I know you, but you know. It, really? it used to be much worse. Even your LinkedIn. Um, I mean, you're pretty, uh, you're, you're a good well, looking no, guy. You know, so you know what year that that's from 2012. That oh, wow. Looked, that okay. picture from 2012. You look quite um, the same. Maybe, maybe oh, the, I'm trying. I'm the trying tan is off. <laughs> you got a little yeah, tan I'm, going on. Yeah, no, I'm definitely trying to, trying to get back down to that weight. But, um, but no, was that I because mean, of work? Like, it was just, you're just working like a dog and um, uh, didn't have time to. No, to I was, I was quite portly at work because of the expense account and uh, eating whatever, <laughs> man. It was, uh, Catches up on just you. a huge perk, by the way. It's like, what are consultants going to do now that they can't charge their meals? Right. Yeah. That was a huge perk. Huge, huge perk. perk. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> There's, there's really a lot of, of it was like a feedback into the fanciness and the prestige of the role um because you know you're, you're going out on the on the client's dime uh you know to eat these fancy meals and it really makes you buy into that image um if you're living that kind of life you're flying everywhere you got the status to you know yep. stay in nice places fly first class have the nice tumi or, or the rimawa luggage yep um, yep you know, just everything kind of just is that feedback loop into that quality of life or that lifestyle that we don't have anymore. That is, that's not something that the new cadre of consultants have, have experienced. It's a different world, a totally different world. And, and we're, we're still going to, I don't think we've netted out in terms of the, the landfall uh, at the end of the day of COVID and the impacts that it's going to have in this industry, right? I, I think it's going to yeah. net out at some point in the next couple of years, but none of that's there anymore. And, and more and more clients are recognizing that that cost was a, I don't want to call it a waste, but they're getting the same productivity and they're, they're getting even more efficiency in some cases uh, from these engagements. Yeah, I, I think sales is probably going to tip the scales um, yeah. eventually, right? It's just going to be this kind of this edge in competition because, you know, while we're pretty happy to say that, you know, the productivity at home is 
is comparable at least right mm -hmm. being on site and people are kind of questioning why we needed them on site in the first place well first of all if you're going to pay that much for anybody right you'd like to be able to see them yeah on demand um i think that's a value that people are going to be struggling with but i think what's going to happen is this so you know say Accenture and Deloitte are bidding for um, work, but they're but they're already on site or, you know, they're at a client doing two separate projects, right? But they have service offerings that they're bidding on, you know, in another area, right? Whoever's on site there, yep. at least from the leadership perspective, right, is going to have the distinct advantage. So like to say that leadership wouldn't travel, that's, I think that would be kind of silly. From a sales perspective, you that, that in-person relationship, um, is always going to have advantage over this type of thing. Right? 100%. And I think that it's just going to be a series of kind of like one-upping each other until we reach kind of a new equilibrium. I don't think mm -hmm. that it's going to be the same as it was before, yeah. but I also don't think that the travel is going to die down as much as people think it's going to be based on the current um, landscape. I just think that it's going to come to a point where it's going to equilibrate based on what people think the competitive advantage is on the consulting side. Right, yeah, of actually yeah. being there. And of course, what the client's willing to pay for. But if you start to lose projects because you're not on site, then you're gonna start pushing for that expense. More and more, right? yeah. Um, so I think that's what's what's gonna carry it. If you start feeling well like you're losing because you're not on site, or if that's that's what's going on in your head and that's what you truly believe, then you're, you're gonna, gonna go push there. for that. And we're gonna reach a new level where maybe it's gonna be like, you know, two weeks on, two, two weeks, weeks off, off or yeah. something like yeah. that, where we kind of reach a balance with the clients. Uh, instead of just being the industry norm to be four days on every week, right? Yeah, no, no I agree. I agree, especially so. for sales. You know, you, you buy from folks who you trust. To exactly. build trust, you got to interact in person. Yeah. Right? We're very social creatures. And at the end of the day, you're not going to build a relationship on, on Zoom, right? And unless you're out the client, shooting the shit, right? Trying to really understand dinners, them at the yeah. human level. <laughs> the got best it. stories come out of the dinners, right? Yeah. <laughs> So that's great. I mean, so you you have a path, right? It seems like you're you're looking to expand and and jump into different channels very quickly with your uh, social media. Now 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 revealing yourself is that an intentional move for that strategy that you're you're sort of going towards maybe on YouTube or is that more of a yeah yeah. So the thing is that you know being being your own brand is always going to be more powerful than being something that's faceless and anonymous. Um, right. Kind of a, a case in point would be like, you know, Mrs. Dow Jones, right? Um, Haley Sachs. So she has her own brand. She is her own brand. She right? is, absolutely. Um, and that to itself is is very powerful because you you don't become this, you know, this kind of anomalous thing that's just kind of floating around in the ether. You, you have a face, you have uh, your own personal brand. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that as a human being um, will build more credibility and and brand power than just being a badge. Right. Just being yeah. a logo. Yeah. So, this is a part of it. Um, but I'm still kind of on the fence um, because it's not something that I'm used to doing. Mm -hmm. um, although arguably public speaking is just something that I've been doing for, you know, as as a job, as, as a job. Right. <laughs> so the transition shouldn't be that hard. Right. In theory. Um, yeah. but coming up with compelling content is always going to be, um, the main issue. Um, you know, putting myself out on, you know, on a face reveal or something like that definitely has partly to do with, you know, whether I'm comfortable, uh, with mm -hmm. how I look at this particular point in time, <laughs> but nobody else really cares. And that's, I think that's just, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's in your head. I exactly. That's yeah. absolutely, uh, uh, there. And, you know, I've, doesn't really matter what you look like. I think that it, it's the strength of the content. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have any content right now um, that to speak of um, that I'm comfortable in, in releasing. Mm. Um, so it's going to take a little bit of thinking um, and planning and planning uh, about how that's supposed to work. Mm. Fair enough. Yeah. So are you are you sourcing your materials for the most part? Or is like, are you are you trying to provide more original content? What's the um, how do you, how do you come up with the memes? I guess, are you sitting there so, and people are throwing stuff at you? So for the most part is, is original content. Um, anything with, with a badge, any, anyway, if it says consulting humor on it, it's something that I've either modified myself or, you know, okay. at least from a caption standpoint, I mean, memes 
the idea is that the picture is just, I mean, I know there are copyright issues in, in say Europe yeah. and the U S hasn't really caught on to that yeah. uh, yet, but the idea is that there's, there's an image, uh, with an idea. And then, you know, you kind of either modify the image or you modify the caption to convey uh, a specific idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's all the memes are. So to say that the memes are truly original content, I think would be misleading, but in the spirit of how memes work, Hey buddy. Oh. In the spirit of how memes work, I don't think that that's, you know, that's enough to say that it's not original content. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I mean in, in, in terms of original content anyway. Um, other than the truly original content, which is, you know, produced and illustrated by myself, yeah, yeah. Um, which is very few and far between, um, simply because it's extremely time consuming. I don't care oh how simple the illustration is. Yeah. It is enormously time consuming uh to do something like that so are you so, drawing them out yourself like literally you you draw them yeah. out yeah yeah hmm. i mean if there are illustrations uh on the page generally they're they're hand drawn um wow I'm, I'm going back to your page because some of them were pretty complex so you're you could draw as well pretty well yeah, yeah. I, well, I, I, I failed really art just... so i i can't you know my standards pretty everything is pretty high for me but i'm Everything that I do, I, I'm serviceable at. <laughs> like, like that. I wouldn't say that I'm I'm good at any particular thing, but I know like enough this, about like this everything. one, this one, this this is hand drawn. Yeah, that's hand drawn. This, yeah. this is for the the camera. Yeah. Wow. That's a that's hand drawn. Hmm. Very nice. Uh, and and you know the T-shirt, of course, and and the, the T-shirt, McKinsey and Company. Um, you know, also trying to buy match, buy consulting humor merch. It's it's hilarious. Which, it's awesome trying to match the typeface because I don't have access to proprietary, uh, the, what is the, uh, the Bauer, uh, yeah, typeface yeah, the type, from McKinsey. Typeface. Um, you know, that's, that was challenging. That was, have you, have you ever gotten into trouble with anything, any, any sort of, uh, messages or any, one of these companies reaching out? So no, but hmm. I feel like I've also been a bit careful about, um, how the work is presented, um, and making sure that it's, you know, protected under under parity laws um and Interesting. i guess ultimately the first amendment right um so i have a shirt that says kmpg right which is clearly parody. <laughs> as long as nobody's really taking it seriously i think i'm okay yeah. um yeah. i don't know i mean we'll cross that bridge when we get there i know some people are really defensive about it but you know i've even talked to microsoft about this and um they're just like, look, as long as like nobody believes that this is actually Microsoft material or, or whatever, although it's not something that I've done, um, it's just something out of curiosity because obviously, you know, there's merchandise, unofficial, unlicensed merchandise for Excel and, and PowerPoint and whatever out there, yeah, keychains yeah. and all this stuff floating around. And I had, had asked Microsoft about this and they're just like, look, like, no, because as long as people don't think it's actually Microsoft creating this stuff, then it doesn't yeah. really matter. Mm. Um, and of course they could choose to, but why? Like, you know, I can't say anything for sure, but like, why would you go after somebody on Etsy selling Excel keychains? It's just kind of silly. Right? Yeah. It's, it's promoting your brand unless you, the, 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 the catch is where I think it, you do have the influence. I think you, you're, you're a million impressions and 300 followers and, and the, the stories that you're telling us where they're, they're folks that are, perceiving certain firms as good or bad based on the collective meme pool that that they've seen. So, so I've also been really careful about that as well. Like there will be imagery, yeah, but there won't be anything that will explicitly state that, you know, say KPMG is of poor quality because not yeah. only is that not what I believe, um, yeah. but I don't think the spirit of the memes are, are really like that anyway. Mm. So for example, I think I have like, I think I have one of Mario Kart where it's like, you know, Deloitte, PWC, EY. And then I think KPMG is, is Wario spinning around after getting knocked out by a, <laughs> by a shell or something like that. Like, yeah, something like that. That's more of an, like more of an image rather than explicitly saying that, oh, you know, KPMG is a lesser firm or something like that because yeah, again, yeah. it's not what i believe and it's not in in terms of like you know just being good humored about it um i think there is a line to be crossed about you know being facetious about something and being kind of a bully about it yeah and yeah. Uh, that's not something that i want to be or i want my material or brand to represent 
Um, so I think I've been pretty, pretty tactful about that. But I, I agree with that. I think, I think it's, uh, you do it well. Um, but, but so do you coordinate some of these memes with some of the other bigger, like uh, management, uh, the, the, what is it, consulting comedy, uh, uh, you know, like, because sometimes I see the same sort of themes go across the board and it becomes the week so, for. I think sometimes it's a bit of groupthink. Um, okay. I think we do look at each other to see what works and what doesn't. Okay. Um, sometimes things will just, I mean, it's just kind of top of mind. And by the way, I think that there's like a limited amount of content or themes that, you know, as consulting, you know, is, uh, today, I think it's, it's pretty limited actually. Um, and expressing any new ideas is more of a rehashing of the nuances of some old ideas or presented yeah. in a different way. Right. Um, because I mean, there's, there's some core tenants out there that we all joke about, but then beyond that, um, and, and if you're trying to avoid very specific scenarios and, and things like that, that people won't generally relate to, right. Um, you have a very limited kind of, um, <laughs> deck that you're working with, so to speak. Right. Makes sense. So makes know. sense. So I don't know, like, I think some of it's coincidence. Some of it is us, uh, you know, kind of looking at what each other's doing. But all in all, I mean, we operate pretty independently. Um, we generally don't talk to each other about content all too much. Do you know um, who they are? Do you know who runs all these channels? Like, are you at least at that level? Uh, no, yes, no. Mm. Um, some, uh, I've met some, I've met- Like the um, big four you mentioned, the big four accountant, which no, I- No, big four accountant is extremely cryptic and um, very protective of his identity. So I don't, I don't know. Um, much about him. I have met uh, some folks out there. Let's get fiscal. Met her. Um, this is my consulting life. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Met him before, but was supposed to meet just the quant, but he stood me up. So never really <laughs> forget about that. Just the quant. We we're waiting for yeah. you. <laughs> we'd love yeah. to have you on the podcast if, if uh, whoever's listening in. But do you see them as competition or just uh, like peers? How, how do you perceive? Because really. I'm seeing a lot of a lot of new channels come up too now. I've always described them as a peer group um, okay. more than anything. Um, I would say, first of all, that I'm the youngest of the three account wise, right? Um, I don't know how long management consulting, or I should say consulting company now, um, or crazy management consultants have been around. Um, I know that they've been around longer than I have. Um, yeah. But I think that there's always going to be an innate sense of competition i mean i don't i don't think we can ever divorce ourselves from that yeah but it's not like we're very cutthroat about it or anything like that i mean i mm. think we're very supportive of what everybody does okay um it's just it's also a difference in personality too because like yes they're um you know we all do memes but i also think that consulting comedy and crazy management consultants i think they each have their own particular brand of of humor i mean i can you know, if you take the, the branding out, I can usually tell, uh, you know, who made it, who made um, who. Yeah. With yeah. What? So I think we're all, we're all, we're all different. Um, you know, we, we all have our own ways of looking at the tropes, um, and these common themes. Um, so yeah, I, I would describe it, um, just as a peer group. more than Excellent. Yeah. Good, good. Getting like darker and darker. Yeah, and no, no. Th thank you yeah. so much for taking the time, Mo. So what's, what's next for you? Just uh, as we as we wrap this up, because I think we we'll see. Man. Um, <laughs> Are we going to see a new billboard one day, right? As <laughs> as the de facto uh, go to source for consulting or courses coming out from you. We'll see. Um, like I said, I I want to branch out into different types of media. I think that educational media uh, with the humorous twist is yeah. something that I would want to do, um, especially just because like. I don't think people um, who want to get into consulting necessarily have um, a resource like that, right? Yeah. A more accessible resource. I think that there's a lot of stuff out there, um, but sometimes it like it gets up its own ass too much. I mean, I don't really have another way of explaining it, but you know what I mean. It gets too too stuffy. Um, yeah, 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 hundred percent self important, and like I just want to kind of display that in a really um, make it real authentic way yeah exactly yeah, yeah. um and kind of not mince words about what's 
what's good and what's bad uh, about it. Um, I've seen people be very, uh, very generous with their description of work-life balance. And like I said, you know, it's, that's a very middle of the road type of, uh, <laughs> type of attitude. And to be honest with you, like, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable, like telling somebody about consulting without kind of going through how it could be on, on both ends. Like it Almost could spectrum. be this yeah. endless soul crushing experience that, you know, like leaves you scarred forever. Um, it could be people yeah. have really bad experiences. And then again, people have really good experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think again, like the, the average of it kind of falls in a place where people are, uh, more or less in agreement that it's at least if nothing else, if nothing else comes from it, then it's a good stepping stone into something else that you might want to do. Um, I think that's, you know, universally agreeable, but the experience that people have from point A to point B can be extremely different. And um, again, you know, I think if I'm going to release anything else in the near future, it'd be something like that. Although mm. I'd have to learn video editing and, and everything like that, which I don't know. <laughs> Happy to help you. Happy to help any, any, anywhere I can. Yeah, I'm sure it's <laughs> and, learnable, some bits and pieces. You know? Yeah, I just don't watch any of those, uh, you know, pay me a thousand dollars. We'll teach you video oh editing within a week. There's, there's that garbage everywhere. God, yeah. But uh, Mo Yang, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Uh, it's been phenomenal. Uh, and and I'm, I'm really, really honored that you chose my forum, my humble uh, uh, podcast and, and channel to reveal. And uh, now folks know the genius behind consulting humor. And I'm, I'm sure we'll see more of you and, and uh, as, you, as you diversify within the different channels and as, as we see more of your face. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Have a great night. All right. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.